Happy Sabbath to you. My name is Shane Hostetler, and uh, thank you, Elder Bo, for uh, getting that correct. I don't hold anybody to that. It's a very long and complicated name, and it doesn't sound like it looks, and so um, I'm not offended at all. And then if you could just resort to Shane, that's just fine. Uh, so I'm the communication director for the Gulf States Conference. The Gulf States Conference is made up of Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, this great part of the Florida Panhandle here and the Seventh-day Adventist churches in it. So my role as communication director is to support all of those churches in, uh, in sharing the positive news like you've got here today, this baptism. Uh, what a wonderful story that is of friendship and it leading someone to be drawn closer to Christ. Um, and so I would like to share that story with the other churches in our conference so that they can be blessed too. Uh, we also have uh, the stories and information that go off and on to uh, the Southern Tidings, so our, our entire union um, here in the South, and at times even beyond uh, to, to the, the nation and more. So um, I also work with churches in their audio and visual needs. Uh, we've got some partnerships at our conference. We're able to get some equipment at a discount. Um, I also have some uh, skills in setting things up and doing some networking and then design. So a lot of the event promotion that happens from the conference level, um, I work on those things too. Uh, so that's the short of it. Um, if you've talked to anybody in the conference, you know that there's always more to it than that. Uh, but my goal, my uh, desire is to um, help make our local churches the best that they can be so that we are representing Christ as effectively as possible. Let me skip. Uh, you've seen this slide a few times, I'm sure. These are some of the social channels that uh, you can follow the Gulf States Conference on. Um, my job is really, again, to support you as local church members. Um, I'm not necessarily going out trying to find new people who don't know about our church. Uh, that's your responsibility, but I'm going to support you to do that. And you can stay up with the, th the resources that are available by following us at um, any of these channels. And of course, you can go to the conference website, uh, gscsda.org, and, and learn more there as well. Um, I was here about a year ago, and I did a seminar on digital evangelism. And since that time, I've been able to film those segments in our studio at the conference office to make those available online. And um, you can go through the entire series, or most of them are like five minutes or less, and learn more about how we can use uh, things like YouTube or podcasts. Uh, or all of the media resources that are already available through uh, ministries like It Is Written and Amazing Facts, and how we can um, harness the power that, we, uh, that somebody else has already created and make a, a positive impact with it. Um, and so you can uh, see those videos. They're on our Gulf States YouTube channel in Vimeo, uh, but also on the website um, at uh, gscsda.org slash digital evangelism. And you're welcome to reach out to me anytime if you want to know more about those. So this morning, I want to take a closer look at the story uh, or a story of David from 2 Samuel uh, that I believe will inspire us to become more reliant on God, less reliant on ourselves, and more willing to do new things when God calls us to do them. But before I open uh, the book of uh, Second Samuel, and we begin to read about that story and dig a little bit deeper. I'm going to pray once more, if you please just bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with me this morning. Lord, I pray that I would not be a hindrance to the blessing that you have in store for everyone here today, but uh, that you would use me, Lord, to uh, draw them closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 2 Samuel, we're going to go to chapter 5 and begin in verse 17. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. We're going to read uh, two verses here. It says, Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up 
to search for David, and David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So leading up to this moment, although David had been appointed as king, there had been that civil war that was taking place uh, between Saul and David. The Philistines here were a familiar enemy. It's this same group that Goliath came from that David had fought previously. But for some time, the Philistines didn't need to bother Israel because Israel was doing a fine enough job of bothering itself, right? Now, you can imagine this scene with me that you have these bitter enemies, one that is dedicated to heathenism and the other, the proclaimed chosen people of God. But the so-called people of God were fighting each other so bitterly that the unbelievers, this heathenistic group, didn't even want to get involved with them. It's kind of sad, isn't it? We shouldn't think about that too long because we might think about the times that maybe we are a bit too willing to fight our own brothers and sisters, that the enemy doesn't need to bother us. Ultimately, however, David was recognized as king, and unity did begin to form with God's people. David conquered the uh, city of the Jebusites and was turning it into Jerusalem, and the Philistines didn't like this. They didn't like that the tide had turned and that there was strength growing with David and Israel, and so they brought their armies together to attack while they felt that they were perhaps a little bit more weak. So by verse 17, the enemy had become organized and they were marching on their doorstep. So let's read verse 19 and see what David does. And verse 19 uh, it reads, So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. Now, I love what David did here. And seemingly, he did this every time before he met success. And that is, before he made a decision, he inquired of the Lord. Now, this doesn't seem like a complicated thing, right? And the reality is that it's not complicated. Before he chose to do something, he took the time and he asked God what to do. It's very simple, but it's very effective. And it's something we ought to be doing a lot more of, right? Because you see, every decision that we make without prayer is at best an educated guess. And sometimes it's not even so educated, right? Now, we're going to be coming back to here to 2 Samuel, um, so don't lose your place there. But I want you to take a look at something with me in the book of John, chapter 8, and verse 28. Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do how much of himself? Nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Jesus doesn't decide without the Father. If Jesus won't decide without consulting the Father, how do we feel like we'll be better off without doing the same? All right, I think we get the point made here. So when we're determining how to reach out to others, we're trying to navigate the, the latest trends of digital life and outreach, uh, let's talk to the expert of experts, okay? All right, jumping back to 2 Samuel, here in verse 19. The Lord tells them that doubtless the enemy is going to be delivered into their hand, right? David wants to know, hey, the enemy's at my doorstep. What am I supposed to do? God says, go after them. I'm going to deliver them into your hand. You're going to have success. And as we continue to verse uh, 20 and forward, we see that that happens. David went to Baal Perazim and defeated, uh, David defeated them there and said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. They left their images there and David and his men carried them away. Continuing verse 22, then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves into the valley of Rephaim. Now, didn't God say that he was going to deliver them into, his, into their hands? They did. The battle was won, correct? Like a breakthrough of water. 
But what's happening here in verse 22? They came back. I don't know if your experience has been any different than mine, but there have been times where I have overcome in some area only to have the enemy come back to that same area much stronger than he did before. This is the experience David was having. The Philistines were defeated, but they came back to, the, uh, to that same valley in force. Maybe not in the same manner that they did the, the first time. Maybe they had more cavalry, or maybe they had more machines of war. But they came back into the same location that they were previously defeated in. Now, earlier when David had inquired of the Lord, God made it clear that they could march against the enemy and that they would have victory. Enemies in the valley, go there, take them on, you're going to win. God wants them to be victorious. So when the enemy comes back into the same valley that they had consulted God on previously, knowing that God wants them to be victorious, it would make sense that they would just march right back into the same valley, do the thing they did before, and they would meet the same success. Does that make sense to you? It seems fairly logical because God is consistent, right? Because God doesn't change. Because God's reliable in all of these positive characteristics that we have come to know God to have. But that's not what David decides to do because before David meets success, he does what? He talks to the Father. Before he decides to do anything, he inquires of the Lord yet again, verse 23. David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up, circle around behind them, and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. Now this, friends, is profound. I don't know if you've caught it yet or not. If I've set it up properly or not. While it would have made sense in a human uh, perspective to just go and do the thing that you've done before because it worked before, Instead, David asked God, God, what do you want me to do? And God changed the plan. God didn't want them to do the exact same thing again. God wanted them to do things a little bit differently in order to meet success. And naturally, when they followed this new direction that God gave them, they did meet success. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching at the tops of the mulberry trees, and you will advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. We need something in our lives today, friends. And it is more reliance on God and less reliance on our own perceived excellence. We think we've got all the right ideas because it worked once before, or twice before, or three times before. God is the only one that knows, and that's who we should rely on. We need this willingness to connect with God and inquire of him what our current plans should be. What, what plan of attack does he have in store for you today? Because it might be different than the plan of attack that he had in store for you last year, or last month, or maybe even yesterday. When it comes to reaching out to others, especially in today's digital age, we need to be more willing to adjust our strategies and techniques to meet people where they are. I want to uh, have you read this quote with me, or not you with me, but listen as I read it, please. Contrary to human planning, it says, unless those who can help are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Now, this is a little cutting because I kind of think my ideas are pretty awesome. But this informs me that maybe my ideas aren't as awesome as I think they are. Perhaps they're a bit narrow. 
Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward. I'm going to raise my hand there. I'll be honest with you. I like to know what's going on, right? I like to make a plan. Under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world, God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. Friends, we have a, a timeless message, positively timeless, but the available mediums that we have they are timely mediums, okay? Timeless message, timely mediums. When Jesus approached people, he spoke to them in terms that they understood. To, to fishermen, he used fishing analogies, right? Jesus could read the crowd. Jesus could understand what people were going through and adapt his presentation so that it made sense to them. Uh, why would we want to do anything different than what Jesus did? I want to share with you this morning the, the current strategy of the global Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, we recognize that the world culture has shifted, right? Uh, the communication uh, platforms and strategies we have available to us today are more diverse and more substantial than they've ever been. So the World Church, through prayer and research, is adopting a, a current strategy, a current marketing strategy, and it's called a story brand strategy. This is not brand new. It's a few years old, but it's still effectual, and I'll explain it more as we continue on. Um, it's done in an effort to improve the effectiveness of our local churches. And again, this is a global campaign. It's not just North America. So a story brand strategy kind of works something like this. Uh, people, us, you and me, we are most familiar and comfortable uh, with our lives being addressed as if it were a story. So the most successful books and movies and dramas in all forms of communicating arts uh, whether it's in an advanced culture or perhaps uh, more uh, traditional cultures, uh, they utilize a similar story structure. Um, and it's what makes us like a book or a movie or remember a historical event because it's presented in this way. It's through this seemingly predictable pattern, even though it's not always noticeable. So in practice, it might look a little something like this. This is what a story brand would look like in a commercial uh, uh, in the commercial arena. I'm going to show you two roofing companies that are made up. Okay, these are fake roofing companies. So the first is the best roof company, and they've been around since 1998, and their motto, their slogan, or whatever their catch is that you just can't top us. Okay, this is a traditional company in line. Just can't top us. We're absolutely the best. You would be silly not to call our company if you need a roof. They're better than everybody else. However, a story branded company would probably look a little bit something more like this. Smith Roofing, helping you stay protected since 1998. Can you catch the difference between the two? One says we're the absolute greatest. You'd be silly not to use us. And the other one says there's something you're trying to do and we want to help you do it. Instead of making bold claims that they're just the best and um, all of that, you come across as a company that wants to help achieve goals. Now, I'm not a roofer. I haven't done the research. Uh, but my best guess is that the reason people call roofers is that their family and their stuff needs protection. And that's what this company does. Helps them stay protected. 
The difference is that you become the hero of the story. You're not just some helpless creature who this other company is going to you know, help out because they're the absolute best. You're the one making the decision. You're the one with the money to spend, right? And they're going to help you to do that. The pattern for a successful story or a story brand is this. And I know this is small. You don't have to follow this. It's just to give you an idea of some flow here, okay? There's a character with a problem who meets a guide who understands their fear and gives them a plan that calls them to action which results in success or failure. That's the storyline to every good story, book, movie, anything. Follows that same pattern. It's the plot to every, every good story. Now, let's bring this back to our church, our local churches. From a marketing standpoint, local churches usually don't fit into this very well. And the reason that we don't is that we have too often and for too long have presented ourselves as the best roof company. We are the best church. If you aren't in here, you're lost. There's no hope for you except for here. Why don't you bless yourself by coming into our presence? It doesn't need to stay this way, folks. Our focus should be shifted to instead of making us as the local church the most important, the hero, that we should rather present ourselves as the guide to the most important character, the hero of the story. Uh, we're, the, we're guiding the individuals that are out there. The individuals that don't know. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. We do have this timeless message, right? We've got something valuable here. We just need to present it in a better way. So here's what that looks like. We have to identify what problem people are facing. All right? If we're going to come across, we're going to give them something. We're going to uh, brand our church. Um, what kind of problem are people facing, and how can we help them to do that? Now, um, I'm glad I wasn't in on this uh, initially because it would seem quite daunting, but what problem is every person around the world facing that our church can help them with? And so uh, the world church, uh, they, of course, they went through this with prayer and in study, and um, I think that they've adopted something quite good. Now, in order to understand this, though, I want you to understand something else. We need to be appealing to the people who are most likely to... Um, to understand what we're offering. And a good way to understand this is when we look through the Bible, we see that there are many places where a spiritual journey of someone is compared to like an agricultural process, right? We have seeds being sown, we have cultivation, we have things growing up, we have weeds being taken away, and we, all, and we have harvesting. Okay, so this theme is used uh, throughout the Bible uh, quite a bit about our spiritual journey. So we also understand that there are people that the Holy Spirit has been working on, been working with, and has been drawing them closer, doing this work. There's been those, uh, those little pieces of impact, like happening to, uh, you know, two people both having gone to an Adventist school and they meet up later at, uh, at work. We want to target the people that are most ready to receive what we have to offer. Are you following me? If we try to appeal to, to people who could care uh, for nothing that Christianity has to offer or that God might have to offer, the Bible might have to offer, we're going to be spending a lot more effort for fewer results. Now, this doesn't mean we don't care about everyone. We absolutely do. Uh, but we want to try to reach the people who are most ready to be reached. There is uh, an illustration given um, where there were gospel workers who were going out into this vineyard and, um, and they were physically picking berries um, or some type of fruit. And there were many who were getting on ladders and they were climbing up really high and they were using, you know, complicated tools to try to get fruit that was really difficult to get to. And it wasn't even quite ready to be picked. While at the same time, there was a bunch of heavy fruit near the ground right where they could easily reach it. And it was almost ready to fall off and onto the ground. Uh, so this is a similar illustration here. We want to get the people who are ready to be got. Okay. 
So here's what we came up with as a world church, the Adventist promise. The Adventist promise is that we can help you understand the Bible to find freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus. Every Adventist should be able to make this statement their own. That we can help someone understand the Bible to find freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus. Uh, through the prayer and the research, we've discovered that there are people out there, there are, are many people out there, there are hundreds and thousands and millions of people out there who are looking for freedom, they are looking for healing, they're looking for hope, and they're willing to go to the Bible to find it. And our role then is to help them understand the Bible so that they can realize that all of those things can be had in a relationship with Jesus. So again, our promise is not about us, right? Our promise is to someone else. And, and what are we promising them? Are we promising them that, that if they come into this building, that this building offers them freedom, healing, and hope? What about the people inside of this building? Do they offer freedom, healing, and hope? Where does freedom, healing, and hope come from? It comes from Jesus. That's what we're directing people to. It's not the role of the church to bring freedom, healing, and hope. The Adventist promise is about helping people understand the Bible so that they get to know Jesus for themselves and through him find hope that they have, the hope that they've been craving. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what this is beginning to look like now. This is how the, this is being practically applied. Yes, I'm here and I'm telling you about it and you should be excited and inspired by it. And that you would want to shift your mentality to think, how can I as a local church member and how can my church fulfill this promise? How can we come across rather than we're the best ought to be with us or else and instead we have something that we can offer you that will be helpful to you and that will get you where you want to go, where your desires have you go. Today when people go to Adventist.org, the, the world's uh, church website, uh, the, the, of the global Seventh-day Adventist Church, this is the promise that they are met with. They are invited to study online through courses that are already available through It Is Written and through Voice of Prophecy and more uh, that have all been um, updated and actually look good and actually are something that you would be um, happy to send someone to. Um, I'm sure many of you have been around long enough to know that there are at times things that are placed into our hands that we would rather not let out of our hands into somebody else's because they don't look the best, okay? Um, I, as a graphic designer, I would not recommend something to you if I didn't think that it was worthwhile to give to someone else or anyone else for that matter. So at Adventist.org, uh, at the beginning of this year, actually, they made the switch over uh, with a new design that's much more appealing and this great system that's in place. When somebody meets this, um, when, when somebody is searching for hope, when, when somebody is looking for freedom and, and they know that it's in the Bible somewhere and, uh, and they start to do an online search for it, uh, our organization is working so that when people make that search, they land at Adventist.org and can be taken through these Bible study uh, steps. And, and what happens is as they complete these Bible study steps, they're connected with local churches. So it may very well be that you'll have somebody that wants to connect with your church because it started with a Google search for finding freedom in the Bible. Isn't that awesome? I have a question for you this morning, church. Could you help someone understand the Bible? Personally. Could you point them to freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus? Because people are going to be looking for that. Uh, advertising and promotion with this promise is, has already gone out. It's been going out for months. Um, I, I, I worked on a, a commercial with the, um, with the General Conference. Um, a, a, I don't know, it's like a 20-second or 25-second commercial that's going to be playing uh, that we're, uh, we're paying to promote on Facebook in our territory. 
um, and the GC is going to use it actually, uh, or the, yeah, sorry, the GC is going to use it across the NAD as well. That invites people to go to Adventist.org, you know, if they're looking for these things. Mo steps are already uh, in place. Things are already in motion. People are already being directed to this, and they may very well just start walking right on in here. Are you ready to bring them in? If you aren't ready, or if you don't know, boy, how can I show someone that there's freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus? Uh, could I actually help somebody understand the Bible? What would I do if somebody came up and asked me, hey, you're the people who say that you can help me understand the Bible, right? If you don't know how to do that yet, that's okay. Because God wants you to help. Uh, God wants to help you to be ready. Right? Because just like David, we can ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And he'll help us to be ready. Are we ready to try new and different things as God directs us to? I pray that you are. If we don't have that intimate experience with God like David did, uh, where we're ready to adjust our, our steps and motions at his call, God is, is really, uh, he, he's, he's willing and he's ready to, to make it so. I'm going to close with this little story. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, my family and I, we were traveling to the Shoals, Alabama area. Um, I was going to preach at the Shoals Church, and uh, we were looking for some things to do, something we could do um, Friday morning before we got to our hotel. And um, I didn't realize this, um, and maybe some of you know, but I've been in this, uh, in the Gulf States Conference, in this territory for uh, more than five years, six, seven years, and I didn't know that the um, Helen Keller's childhood home is in Shoals, Alabama. I hear, oh, wow, so I'm not the only one. I was like, just Google things to do, Shoals, Alabama, Helen Keller home. So great. If you ever have a chance to go up there, highly recommend it. Incredible story. Uh, they have tons of stuff there at the home. Okay, so we went to the Ivy Green home in Shoals, Alabama. These are my two sons, Jack and Henry. And they are standing by the water pump. Now, you guys know what I'm talking about when I say the water pump? All right, it is the water pump where Helen Keller finally had that breakthrough moment where she was able to understand sign language being made in her hand while the water was running over it. So awesome. Now, <clears throat> they told us that the water pump, it is the original water pump, but it was just a regular old water pump. What they've done to it now is they've built a patio around it, right? They've added a cover on top. Because they're trying to preserve something here, right? The water pump doesn't work anymore. But what they've done is they've actually added a new pump and they can have a hose attached to it and they can run a hose over to it and put the hose into the pump and make it look like it's running sometimes if they want to. Okay, so why Helen Keller? Why the, why the pump and all of this? When, when I saw the pump that was there in this pivotal moment that took place, I couldn't help but think of the spiritual experiences that many of us have had. Uh, maybe it was that we grew up as Christians, but then we had that one devotional time, or maybe there was that one sermon, or maybe there was that one interaction with a friend where everything just became so much clearer. Or maybe if we didn't grow up as, as Christians, maybe um, uh, many of us can probably think back to one of those uh, pivotal moments in our spiritual journey and they've kind of cemented themselves there. A big moment like this was for Helen Keller, but in, in a spiritual way. What they did with this pump is they built a patio around it. They built a cover over it, and it stopped working, so they're artificially filling it in. And I kind of wondered, are we doing the same thing with our own spiritual experiences? Or maybe that one spiritual experience that we had a long time ago. Where rather than having a continued spiritual experience, a continued growth in our relationship with God, that we have built a monument to that one time where we had a good connection with God. And it doesn't even work anymore, and so we're bringing in a hose from a different pump somewhere else to fake it. So we feel like we're making it. 
Now, I don't have a problem with them doing this with Helen Keller's pump because I think it's really cool and I'm glad that they're keeping it intact, okay? But we can't do that with our spiritual experiences. Yes, we should remember them. Yes, we should build from them. Yes, we should go on and grow from them. But we must have an ongoing and growing experience with God. We must have a connection like David did where we are willing to ask God, God, today, what do you want me to do? Lord, today, how will you have me go forward? At this very moment, wherever you are in your relationship with God, you can have hope in him. You can know that he wants to draw you closer to him. That if all you have is one or two or a handful or less of big spiritual experiences in your past, that he wants to give you more of those. But he's inviting you to a closer walk with him. Let us seek God as David did. And let us be willing to employ the new strategies that God has in store for us. The message is the same. It's timeless. But the way we deliver that message, it ought to be relevant so that people can hear it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with each and every one of us that are here in this building, those that are joining online. Father, that you would guide and direct us. Lord, that we wouldn't be so caught up in ourselves, in our own expertise, that we would be unwilling to listen to what you have in store for us today. Lord, we're grateful for a uh, a marketing campaign that helps to more effectually show who the true character of God is. That God isn't one that comes across to say, I'm the best and you just need to follow me or else. But instead says, I have something to offer you to make your life better. Lord, if there's a new strategy that comes about, something more effective than a story brand strategy, I pray that we would adopt it too. Because I want and I pray and I believe that you want us to effectively deliver your gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.